squat, 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 right. 2022. The All Blacks just about held on to win in arguably the best and most competitive rugby championship ever. La Rochelle did the impossible and seized the Champions Cup in the most extraordinary circumstances. And Wayne Pivac got sacked by Wales. But in amongst the losing to Georgia and the losing to Italy, this was a year in which some rugby was played by some people, a bit of, you know, just not Wales. And so to celebrate the best of that rugby, it's time for this. The Squid Rugby Team of the Year. But it was also a year in which some rugby was refereed by some people, so it's only right to recognise the best there's been this year and name the referee of the year. Luke Pearce continues his incredibly high standard from last year and Wayne Barnes his incredibly high standard from the last 19 years, but whilst I feel three referees shone for their consistency, accuracy and clarity, only one had the edge on sheer prolificness. This year, Holly Davidson became the first female referee to officiate a Tier 1 men's test match. She became the first referee to oversee a 15s and 7s World Cup final, and she did them both in the same year, controlling in that 15s World Cup final what could have been a heated, overwrought final and dealing with the tricky moment, the red card to the nailed-on favourites, perfectly. She's clear, concise, she's popular with players, she's just excellent, and if there's any justice in the world, she should be just a few months away from joining Sarah Cox as the first woman to referee at a men's World Cup. Honestly, it would be so deserving, she's been outstanding. But before we get there, it's time to look back instead. Namely, at the midfielders who made marmalade of their oppositions. It's the best centres of 2022. The contenders for 13 this year have been stacked sky Hi, I haven't been so unsure where a shirt is going to go since I let my washing machine send a Christmas present. And yet, one contender has a real edge. The Kanye Ram looked to have the shirt sewn up yet again, only spent more of the year on the operating table than the actual pitch. Robbie Henshaw and Gary Ringrose both had exceptional years for Ireland. Henshaw, well, heralded, yet Ringrose has become that rare player who was so hyped as a youngster that they're now underrated as a fully formed adult. He's just been fantastic, but the two of them kind of shared the 13 shirt for Ireland. As Emily Scarra, who's been quietly excellent, using herself as a decoy or link player to create space for others in a way that muted her plaudits yet maximised her team's success. Marley Philippon and Hannah Jones are both absolute rocks for their respective nations, bringing an edge in attack but flawless decision making without the ball, both fantastic. And we have the shirt's closest contender, Australia's Len Iketau, who broke through in 2021 but in 2022 became world class. He's like a wise old owl with the strength of the tree trunk that he lives in. A smart midfielder who not only shored up Australia's defence but added some directness to their attack. But really the standout quality that he he's added this year is an outstandingly smart kicking game. He's got a real knack for knowing when to launch a duel that can get Australia on top, where to place it. He's such a weapon for Australia. He's exactly the player they need most. Eight players in the mix, but none of those other seven were the best player in a World Cup final. And so, Lacan Yuam gracefully hands the shirt over to the Black Ferns. Stacey Flula. And there can scarcely be a better handover too, because Flula exudes the exact same kind of class as am, and that is the highest compliment I can ever pay a 13. But where the South African does it with kind of the Clint Eastwood calm expressionless face, Flula does it with the biggest, broadest, almost goofiest grin anyone has ever seen. There isn't even a Julia Roberts Hollywood analogy. There's no one with as big a grin as Stacey Flula, tearing teams open with a subtle step whilst all smiling like she just heard the aftermatch function has an unlimited supply of custard. She was a shining light through the Black Ferns entire season, but grew brighter and brighter the Close they got to the World Cup, and in the fervour, the World Cup went on. Her attacking prowess opening up endless space for the Woodmans and Tuies of the world, including this absolute magic ball taking a shoddy pass but turning it into a two on one before throwing a wonder ball over the top for Woodman to finish. But she also crossed herself in the semi and most notably the final, where we saw all her tricks in one go. Watch the look on her face as she sells Scarrett down the river. The grin spreading before she's even made the break and only spreading cheek to cheek as she gets up into support and runs the score that puts the ferns within touch right after the halftime break. A year of big moments underpinned with the largest of them all on the grandest stage. An edge over all other centres out there. The shirt deservedly belongs to Stacey Flula. If you have ribs, there's a 68% chance Gabrielle Vernier has tackled them this year. And if you don't have ribs, 
there's a 99% chance it's because Gabriel Vernier knocked them clean out of your body this year. A mainstay in the French team for some years now, in 2022, Vernier finally garnered the mainstream attention she's been deserving for a while, with some of the most eye-catching hidden work performances you'll ever see. I would posit Vernier is the best defensive 12 in rugby right now at any level, male, female, who gives a shit? Dog's rugby, she's better than any dog playing 12. Whilst her ability to make shots the size of the Basque region might get her the attention, her ability to shut down any and all threats is what really makes her so worthwhile for France. France had the best defence of any side at this year's World Cup, keeping both finalists to their lowest scoreline in not just the tournament, but for five years. For over the whole World Cup cycle, both of the finalists scored their fewest points in five years against France in this World Cup, and most of that was because of Vernier's defensive prowess. She was front and centre of that effort, as well as offering nuts and bolts perfection in her attacking game. This line, picked last second and so intelligently hiding herself behind the referee, is typical of what she brings to any team she plays in. Crash, bang, wallop, that thinks first. She's like an intercept missile that obeys the Green Cross code, checking both sides and making the smartest decision before exploding everything in her path. With the ball or without. For those of you still holding onto your ribs, keep a keen eye out, because Vernier is far from done. I've given notice to a fair few honourable mentions already, but honestly guys, Lena Catal was unreal this year and would have deserved that shirt. Last year's wearer, Gael Piku, was also superb and complimented Jonathan Dante extremely well, who broke through, who stepped up into a bit of a vacancy in the French side and smashed the shit out of it. He was brilliant coming from a place of kind of, you know, looking like he wouldn't make it international level to then this year being just phenomenal. Speaking of uh, smashing the shit as well, Sami Karevi once again looked on track to dominate the centre channels, only then barely play, what, three games for Australia? But I mean, what are three games? He's excellent. Owen Farrell had a great second half of the year, bringing real consistency to England, but it was four other second playmaker types who really shone for their respective nations this year. Farrell's English counterpart, Helena Rowland, was a key cog in the Red Rose machine, capable of basically anything on a rugby field and so rugby literate. Alexandra Tessier was so good for Canada, a lady who unlocks defences more often than her own iPhone. She was a key part of this Canada team that flew under the radar, but was so accurate, so excellent, just quietly went about their business. And Cecilene Undonu got Fiji playing the best rugby their women's side has ever played, scoring a great try against England as well. But the real second shout has to go to the self-proclaimed number one player herself, Beatrice Rigone. If you're a fan of men's rugby who has never really paid attention to women's rugby, it still made it this far in the video. Firstly, good on you. Love it. Appreciate it. Thank you very much for doing so. But secondly, man, what you get to discover, Beatrice Rigone, you get to discover one of the biggest treats in rugby. She's a perfect package 12, a distributor who loves to risk it all on an option that requires a 100% perfect pass. And she never seems to throw it any less than 99%. She always seems able to pull off the ballsy thing she's going for. She's an utter joy to watch with a full complete all-round game and was a key player in Italy's push towards their first ever quarter-final. Thank you for watching that. That is the second of six, six. videos on the team of the year. Uh, the next one on the halfbacks will be up tomorrow. Please let us know who you think will be in there and whether you think they'll... they'll... I think it will be Fauri de Priya. It's not a very good guess. Um, there's loads more coming. There's also the podcast on the 2007 World Cup. If you fancy going back and look, listening to us talk about Fauri de Priya. does have Fauri de Priya. That will come up. Plus, you know, everyone else played in 2007 covering every game. That's on all good podcast places, as well as obviously the rest of the rugby in this. We'll see you very shortly tomorrow, this time tomorrow, for more halfback-based rugby. Fauri de Priya. Can I do a little thing? Okay. Allô, allô, les Français Qui ne saute pas n'est pas Français hey Qui ne saute pas n'est pas Français hey Qui ne saute pas n'est pas Français hey Qui ne saute pas n'est pas Français Thank you so much. Merci beaucoup, thank you so much.